Let me say to the first woman president of the Lot Carey Foreign Missions Convention, Dr. Gina Stewart, we are so proud. We are so honored to have you as our leader. We are so grateful to God and believe that you have been called for such a time as this. You have been a model of what we want to be as women preachers. And I could go on and on, I'm going to stop right there. Um, to our immediate past president, Greg Jackson, and to other past presidents, Dr. Greg Moss, Dr. Keith Troy, Dr. Clifford Jones, and others who may be here, to the board of directors and the officers, uh, uh, and to our executive secretary, Dr. Emmett Dunn, Congratulations for pulling off a phenomenal first meeting, and um, we praise God for you. I realized uh, last night that this is the first time in two years that I have worshipped in church uh, in two years in the church building, and um, it was a joy. It has been a joy throughout this time together that we've shared um, to do that, to um, our thriving in ministry director, Dr. David Goatley, and our thought leader, Dr. Jacqueline Madison McCreary, staff members and friends, to Lottie and Dottie and everybody. God bless you and thank you for this opportunity. It is good to be here. I wanna thank you for the invitation to share in this moment and to proclaim as others have done so capably this week, the unsearchable riches of God. And I am both trembling and grateful at the same time. Um, having participated in Pastoral Excellence Team 8 and also in the Thriving in Ministry Journeys, I can say without risk of hyperbole and without risk of exaggeration that I likely would never have survived ministry if it had not been for Lot Carey. And so I owe a great debt of gratitude to this organization for um, assisting along the way, bolstering, holding me up, and teaching me uh, along the way and allowing me this part of the journey. Please allow me just a moment of pulpit privilege to recognize my husband, the Reverend Dr. Jesse Wood. I think he's in here somewhere. I haven't seen him yet, but he's here. And um, I am so grateful. He's here, there he is, amen, amen, amen. Thank you um, to my husband um, and to a member who traveled with me and to the sisters and brothers of the Thriving Ministry Program um, that just concluded your presence is a blessing, but I also want you to help me as you already have done, celebrate uh, Dr. David Satcher, who was our 16th Surgeon General and Assistant Secretary for Health, only the second person in history to simultaneously hold both of those positions former CDC director and former president of Meharry College. And so um, indeed greatness is in the room. I never felt when I was speech writing for Dr. Satcher that it was just a job. I always knew that it was a calling from God, that it was a ministry. And so I was so honored to serve and so honored to have he and his wife, Eddie, with us on today. So praise the Lord for them. Amen. Let us go ahead and get to work. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 85. Psalm 85, and I'll read it in your hearing. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again so that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what, the Lord will, what God the Lord will speak for he will speak peace to his people, to his faithful, to those who turn to him in their hearts. Surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. But listen to this part. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and the righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. 
This is the word of God for the people of God, and we do give thanks to God for the time that is ours together. I want to talk about the subject or talk from this subject, what if? What if? What if? Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, we bless you and we thank you for what you have already done. You knew what we needed before we needed it, and you went ahead and provided it. Thank you for these days that we have been gathered together to be enriched, to be encouraged, to be reminded, O oh God, that you still are with us and still see us and are still guiding our steps. Now in this moment, I pray that you would bless your preacher to do what you have assigned her to do. Speak how you want to speak, say what you want to say, do what you want to do in this place. As we are leaving, help us to carry forward that which you have given. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What if? 20th century author and evangelist Leonard Ravenhill wrote this. No person is greater than his or her prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The pulpit can be a shop window to display one's talents, but the prayer closet allows no showing off. Poverty stricken as the church is today in many things, he continues, she is most stricken here in the place of prayer. We have many organizers, but few agonizers. Many players and pay, but many players and payers, but few prayers. Many singers, few clingers, lots of pastors, few wrestlers, many fears, few tears, much fashion, little passion. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing her, we fail everywhere. I thought that since we started with prayer on Thursday, Wednesday, whatever day that was, that Dr. Stewart blessed us, we would go home on prayer as well. Because Ravenhill contends that when done properly, prayer grasps eternity. It is the forerunner to transformation and revival. It is the impetus also for this Psalm 85, which I read in your hearing, this Psalm that is a communal prayer that calls on God to move in a mighty way among a people who have been in crisis people who have been in exile, who've been isolated, away from home, away from church as they had always known it. We don't rightly know what caused the crisis that they were referring to because we're not given any dates in this psalm. There's nothing to anchor the psalm to, to tell us what they were really talking about. Some scholars connected to the end of the Babylonian exile when the Israelites were scrambling to regain their footing other, psalm, uh, other um, um, scholars think that it may have been during Ezra and Nehemiah's rebuilding of that wall. We just don't know exactly when it was, but what we do know is that the, it was the crisis that brought the community together in communal prayer. And I would contend, church, that maybe it's good, we don't know for sure, because we might be tempted to limit God's activity to that particular kind of crisis and that kind of timing and miss out on all that God is possibly calling us to reimagine as we move forward, that we might miss, on, miss out on potentially petitioning God to restore us in our situation if we actually anchor too much on that situation. Maybe it's good we don't know what it was all about. We might miss reimagining that God could show up and do a thing with our crisis because you do know that we have a tendency to limit God, just to ask God for a new building when we might need to ask God for the city. We ask God to seek healing. We go for healing when we need to really be asking to be made whole and be made useful and be given some purpose. We ask God for next semester's tuition when we should be seeking something that goes exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think or imagine. Whatever their crisis was, it led them to pray communally for God to show up. And that's a good idea because if it's true, and I believe that it is, that God never wastes a crisis, 
then surely God can show up in our post-COVID or what we believe might be post-COVIDness and grant us the favor of new imaginings, new what ifs. What pastors, we pastors and church leaders who have, have, have to scramble, have had to scramble for two years to have become audiovisual technicians and graphic designers and internet experts and trust in, and Zoom gurus. And if I hear another person say, unmute yourself, I think I'm gonna go crazy just because we've been had to get into these new boxes and do church from a box. And I don't know what I'm gonna do trying to get back with this hybrid thing. But not to mention, we've had to do all of that. We've also had to become public health officials and pandemic researchers and viral investigators, even as we have wagered our own well-being and the well-being of our congregants. We have navigated some unchartered waters and choppy seas as we tried to do church and be community in illogical ways, in unfamiliar circumstances, in unfamiliar settings, with unfamiliar tools. How do you function as a community? when you can't even come together like you used to do. Can't embrace with a holy hug and a holy kiss. Have to keep a certain distance from people, from the next person to the next person. Have to put our seats a little bit apart from each other. Can't even touch each other. If we high five, we gotta reach way over and then we gotta use sanitizer to make sure everything is okay. How do you do community in the midst of all of this? And how do you show empathy? When there's a mask on your face, hiding 50% of your face and let somebody else know that you feel what they feel and you know what they've gone through. We have never been here before and I do believe Pastor Troy's daddy was right. We must pray. And that's what's going on here in this text. Tradition divides this psalm into three parts, verses one through three, look back at the crisis that the children of Israel had been through and testifies to God's deliverance. You do know that every now and then it's good to look back at what God has already brought you through. You do know that, don't you? Everybody ought to take time to remember what God delivered you from and brought you out of. Remember how you did not know you would make it after your mother died, but God rolled back the clouds day by day and brought you through with a new compassion and a deeper faith. Remember how you thought it was over for you after you had to drop out of school or after you got laid off from your job, but look at you today, not just surviving, but thriving because what you thought was a roadblock only turned out to be a detour. Remember how you thought you would throw in the towel after that last relationship ended and you vowed to never trust nobody no more, but God pieced together the pieces of your fractured heart and now you're on the road to confidence and intimacy. It's good to look back every now and then at what God has brought you through, to remember that since God's past mercies brought you through that, then God can bring you through again. That's what remembering does. It gives us confidence to know that if God did it before in the past, God can do it again in the now. So listen to the language of those first three verses. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You pardoned all their sin. You withdrew all their wrath. You turned from your hot anger. That's looking back. They can stand on their petition now because they are remembering what God had done for them in the past and they have built up equity in their faith in God. The transcript of God's past dealings is etched on their hearts and they are are praying and remembering because it's good to remember. But Dr. Willie Francois remind us that remembering is not all that we can do. There's verses four through seven where the Psalm writers appeal to God in the present of their condition, saying, okay, God, we remember all that, but we're going through something right now and enough is enough. Anybody ever had to say enough is enough to God? God, I don't think I can handle anymore. Enough is enough. I've been going through this a long, Lord, do you see me still down here? Enough is enough. Do, do you understand the weight of this situation, Lord? Enough is enough. How how much long, how long, oh Lord, because enough feels like enough. 
4 through 7 says that during the battle, they, they remember that they lost some things, that even though they had come through, they lost some things in the battle that they can't get back on their own. It says, you, so, so, so it's like saying, Lord, you brought me through this illness, and, but I lost my confidence in the process. You, you lifted me from the pit of despair, but while I was there, I lost my job. My family got fed up and walked out. My friends grew weary. I lost some stuff. And, and in the aftermath of it all, the psalm writer asked for a hard reset, a control-alt-delete on the situation so that things can reset and change. And the petitioning God to restore that which was lost and then to revive that which is dead. Somebody who has survived any kind of ordeal like that, but who is still suffering from the lingering effects, knows what I'm talking about. You got through being broke, got over being broke, but now you're scared with your money because you don't ever want to be broke again. You got through the heartache and the heartbreak, but now you're scared to trust anybody else with your heart. You know what I'm talking about, the lingering effects. But here's, here's, here it is where I really want to hang our hats this morning, and I'll let you go. It's this third part in verses 8 through 13 that I want to anchor our attention as we depart this amazing time that we've had together here. And it's where the writer pivots from the rearview mirror and even pivots from the present view to looking through the windshield of new new imaginings with a willing hopefulness at the future possibilities awaiting them. It, it, it's here that they turn to the future and pray a, a, a not yet but maybe so kind of prayer. A not yet, it hadn't happened not yet, but maybe so. What if, God, you might do some things that we ain't never seen before? What if, after all that we've been through, you might show up in ways that we've never understood? We've never. What if we are dared to believe that you might do some things Lord, that we have never even imagined because you are a what if kind of God. What if, Lord, and this prayer imagines the world as it could be and as it should be. It's a world where they reimagine that the heavens open up and we see the glory of God coming down. Listen to the poetry of their words. I'm a word person. It says, verse 9, surely his salvation is at hand for those who fear him, for the glory, his glory Glory may dwell in our land, that steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Yeah. Woo, I like it, I like it, I like it, I like it. Righteousness and peace will kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. It's here that the writers of this psalm begin to reimagine after all the stuff that they have been through what it might be like when God comes back and moves in the situation. I told you I'm a word person. Steadfast love, that, that, that it's steadfast love, that, 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 that steadfast love is the mercy. The Hebrew says it's the Hesed love. It is, it is dogged in its determination. It is unfailing. It is unconditional. It's not going to let you go until it gets you. That steadfast love that won't take no for an answer. And then faithfulness is going to meet up with that. And righteousness and peace are going to kiss each other. And all of that's good. That arrested my attention when I was praying about what to bring on today. It the, the imagery captivated my mind, and I wish I could deal with that more. But God said, no, 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 keep reading, because even further down is where it gets more interesting. And this is what I want to leave you with on today. Faithfulness is going to spring up from the ground, and righteousness is going to look down from the sky. No, 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 that's good on its face value. But I need to let you know that, 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 that it's who wrote this that makes it even more powerful. Now, we may not know the when of all of this when it happened, and we may not be able to pin down the why the writers wrote this, but we do know the who. If you look up in your Bible at the top, it, it, it'll say the sons of Korah or the Korahites wrote this. 
And what you need to know is that this psalm is one of the 11 psalms recorded by the Korahites. You know, it's 150 psalms. 11 of them are written by the Korahites. And the Korahites are descendants of Korah. That makes sense, doesn't it? The Korahites came from Korah. But Korah was Moses' first cousin who rebelled against Moses. Now, he, he, he rebelled against Moses while Moses was on assignment for God. <laughs> First cousin rebelling against him. The story is in number 16. You can read all about it. And because he caused a great revolt against Moses, he died along with 250 of his conspirators. That I, I could go off right here and talk about, that's why you ain't gotta worry, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord. I, I could talk about telling you, you don't have to fight every battle, because God, if you are on assignment for God, God will fight your battles. So I could go off right here and go on to that, but that's not even where I wanna go this morning. I need to let you know that, that the folks better think twice before they go up against the person that God has chosen to carry out God's plan, thinking that they have a better plan, thinking that they have a, a better way, thinking thinking that, oh, this is the church and I got to protect the church from the pastor. I got to do this. I got to do that. No, no, no. If God has put that person on assignment, you better be careful because God is going to make sure God's assignment go forth. And if God has to move you out of the way, God will move you to make sure that goes forth. Here's, here's the thing, but check this out. That's not even it yet. It's the how. God took them out <laughs> that matters right here because numbers lets us know that God caused the earth to open up her mouth and swallow him and all that appertained to him. The conspirators died the conspirators who were working with him against what God had planned also died in the process and they died because the ground swallowed them up and fire came down and burned them. And, 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 and here's the thing, God allowed the descendants of Korah to live because they were not in cahoots with all that messiness that was going on in the church. And that ought to be a message to somebody who gets involved with messy folk in the church. You better leave them alone and follow what God is doing in the midst. Let those folks go. Don't get caught up in the conspiracies and the jibber jabber and the chitter chatter and all that. Do what God has called to do. So here we are now over in Psalm uh, 85 and we find out that these have now become, these descendants have now become the, the, the musicians and the singers and the composers and they're the ones who put together that beautiful language that I read for you because God had kept them on assignment. They're the ones who wrote as the deer pants for the water, so my soul thirsts for you. They're the ones who wrote in Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. They're the ones who wrote in Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. And here we are some generations later with the descendants of Korah who were spared that horrible death of being swallowed up by the earth. Here we are listening to them declare with prophetic imagination. Somebody say prophetic imagination. Prophetic imagination that faithfulness will spring up from the ground. You missed it. You missed it. I told you a minute ago that their ancestors had gotten swallowed in the ground. And now here they are declaring later that faithfulness will spring up from the ground so that they who were spared and remained were able to reimagine. They were able to see a new thing springing up 
from the horrible thing that had happened before. I don't know about you, but that excites me that God can turn something awful into something wonderful if we could just reimagine with the eyesight and the heart of God. You do know, you do know that we who are Tootsie Roll colored and chocolate and butterscotch and pecan colored have had to deal with that all our lives, don't you? You do know that we have had to prophetically imagine that which is not as though it could be. Prophetically imagine ourselves free while we were enslaved. Prophetically imagine ourselves full when our stomachs were running empty. Prophetically imagine ourselves that we would one day be president of the United States even when we had never been that before. Prophetically imagine that a woman could lead the lot, carry foreign mission convention in a time like this even when we had not seen it before. Prophetically imagine that a black woman would be seated on the Supreme Court. A chocolate colored black woman would be seated on the Supreme Court even as oppositional forces come against her in mighty ways but she's being brought up and I do believe that she has been called for such a time as this. I do believe, I do believe that what God has put in order that even those evil doers will not be able to stop. But I heard a preacher say once that if God be for me then who can be against me? And so this is all I want to let you know. What if what if, what if we just imagined all of us who are gathered here today this week, what if we went home with, to our respective lands, north, south, east, and west, and use our prophetic imaginings to see God bringing something good out of all of this that has been swallowed up in the past two years? What if? What if? What would happen if we allowed our prophetic imaginations to perceive possibilities where we had only seen pitfalls? What if? What if we imagined a new thing springing up from the place where death used to be, where destruction used to be, where despair used to be? What if? What if we let go of past expectations and limitations and began believing anything we were ever taught and started seeing with new eyes, believing that the illogical can become possible? What if we imagined that from the setbacks of the pandemic, we could raise that $1 million for Lot Carey by August and maybe even $2 million? What if? What if while everybody else is counting us out, underestimating our potential, minimizing our contributions, that we took a lot, another look at ourselves and reimagined that we really are fearfully and wonderfully made? What if? What if we imagined our resources as a commodity to be shared with others so that we are not the storehouse of the people's money, but a conduit? through which we can lavishly and generously share with those people who have no running water, no electricity, no books, no health care, no education, whose spirits are broken, whose hearts are perplexed, whose hope is crushed, so that they can have what they need, and by God's grace, we'll still have what we need. What if? What if we went home and remembered what God did before? reimagined ourselves praying until something happens and then really praying and believing and petitioning that God can do something good out of what has already happened. I believe the God who allowed this pandemic would be the same God who would hear our prayers in verse 12 of this psalm. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase, and righteousness will go before him and will make a path for his steps. This is the word of God for the people of God. And come on, what if we gave thanks to God even now already? What if we started right now praising God for what God is about to do? What if, what if we just believe beyond our own capacity to ask, think, or imagine, and let God be God? and do what God wants to do with God's people. What if we became the people of God, called by God to do God's will? May the Lord God bless you real good.